Thank you for taking the time to watch this video on documentation. This presentation was originally created by EMS University, EMS instructor Alan Burr. I hope you enjoy it. Documentation has always been the most pivotal and arguably the most important aspect of any healthcare professional's job function. Documentation has and continues to grow the healthcare industry by leaps and bounds on a daily basis. Patient charts allow us to grasp an understanding of a patient's ailment and determine whether the healthcare provider's interventions had any positive or negative change in his or her condition, but only when written accurately with as many pertinent details as possible. Without proper charting we may not be providing the best appropriate treatments for our patients and cannot progress medicine to the levels necessary for finding such cures. As a result we may even be found to be guilty of negligence. Our documents, especially in EMS, give other healthcare providers and researchers the necessary information to allow for quality continuity of care. In EMS we are in a unique situation where we are the eyes, ears, and hands of the healthcare professionals that cannot be on scene of every call. It is our duty and responsibility to ensure we relay the privileged information we encounter to those necessary for the best patient outcomes. We are patient advocates and our documentation may have a direct impact on our patient's survival. We may hand off such critical information through a verbal report one healthcare provider may have partially listened to, or maybe even a team of doctors and nurses. Once we go back in service however, the only patient information pre-hospital to be found is what you left on your chart when all else is forgotten. Documentation is the essence of great patient care. Recording patient findings. General impression. When you first make patient contact as an EMS professional, you are automatically performing an assessment of his or her condition based on cues your senses are providing you, even before you are physically near your patient. This is known as your general impression or first impression. This can be a very useful tool for the trained provider. When enough experience is obtained, the general impression can tell the responder a lot about the nature of a patient's condition and how severe and rapid the intervention required. It is important to document how the patient first presented to you. Was the patient blue or pale? Was the patient struggling to breathe, sitting in a tripod position? Was the patient alert and asking for help, or was the patient unconscious? Was the patient complaining of belly pain, or was the patient vomiting uncontrollably? The patient's initial presentation gives us a wealth of information, and although we may not be able to determine any illness, injury, or cause thereof without further assessing the patient, it gives us a great idea of where to start looking. Many responders feel their first impression gives them a sixth sense or gut feeling of how the call will progress. These findings, along with your physical assessment, will help in justifying your treatment and transport later on. Be sure to document your general impression accordingly. The Chief Complaint the chief complaint is the core of EMS training and our treatment decisions. Our assessments are governed by what ails the patient and how we can best relieve their pain or increase their chance for survival. A patient may have multiple complaints or injuries, but the chief complaint is the one that bother them the most. If it is unclear what the patient's chief complaint is, ask. The patient will tell you what hurts the most or what is causing the most discomfort. If the patient is unconscious or unable to communicate, their apparent life threat is their chief complaint. Many times it is determined by mechanism, such as a gunshot wound or a broken leg. If the patient has an altered mentation that is not normal for him or her, then their chief complaint is altered level of consciousness. If the patient is unresponsive or in cardiac arrest, then that is his or her chief complaint. It is sometimes difficult to determine what the exact chief complaint is, but it should always be what the patient states, the physical injury or bodily harm or the change in mental condition. Death or specific mechanisms such as car versus pedestrian or fall injury, despite many arguments, are not chief complaints. These examples are mechanisms of injury. The complaint or injury the patient suffers as a result of these mechanisms is the chief complaint. The nature of illness such as an overdose or asthma attack are not considered chief complaints either. Instead, the patient's chief complaint may be a lock or shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Patient Assessment When assessing your patient, it is important to gather as much information as possible. Depending on the nature of the patient's chief complaint or life threats, a rapid, quick general assessment may be warranted for immediate stabilization, or a more methodic, focused, and specific exam may be performed. 
Whichever the patient's signs and symptoms call for, be sure to document all your findings and the basis of your initial exam. Depending on how much time you may spend on scene or in transport, depending on your patient's condition, a complete and thorough exam may not be completed, such as a focused exam. There is, however, always time for a quick initial head-to-toe examination. If time or patient condition permit, a secondary or focused examination should always follow without exception. These exams must be thoroughly documented in your patient care report, PCR, and any variance or incompleteness must be explained. A rapid head-to-toe assessment can be completed in less than one minute simply scanning, feeling, inspecting for any major life threats, front and back, exposing your patient, only if the patient's symptoms and complaint, as well as your general impression and themechanism of injury slash nature of illness calls for such. Once this is complete, you may perform a more complete physical assessment after life threats have been addressed. If the patient's condition does not call for a rapid assessment, a focused assessment may be performed, again depending on the patient's chief complaint. A complete examination slash assessment may still be warranted. Detailed physical examination. When performing your methodic head-to-toe assessment, which is common practice in altered or unresponsive patients with unknown etiology or in situations with multisystem trauma, the examination should not take more than a minute or two at the most, dependent on patient needs, equipment, or environment. During the assessment, you will be inspecting, palpating, and auscultating where necessary, keeping the nature of the patient's illness or injuries in mind. Some providers feel that percussing is a useful tool, but it is a difficult assessment tool to master and takes years of practice, however, may be used as well. Starting with the patient's head, it is important to document obvious deformities or crepitus, any deep lacerations or punctures, any bleeding, discoloration, or clear fluid discharge, as well as any open skull fractures. When assessing the face and subsequent features, it is important to look for any obvious facial droop, symmetry, bleeding, or clear fluid discharge, possible CSF, from the ears, eyes, nose, mouth, scalp, missing teeth, airway compromise or suctioning, any crepitus, deformities or injuries, and pupil assessment bilaterally. When assessing the neck, ensure to look for any fractures, step-offs, crepitus, contusions, tracheal deviation, jugular vein distension, stomas, central lines, or any other obvious injury or abnormality. Apply appropriate sized cervical collar per local protocols as necessary. Assess the patient's chest for any sucking chest wounds, flavel segments, bleeding, or any other obvious deformity or injury, including paradoxical movement or shallow respirations. Assess lung sounds bilaterally, administer medication, or consider needle thoracotomy per local protocols if deemed necessary per findings. Consult online medical control. Consider artificial ventilations to assist respirations if necessary. Inspect for any pacemakers, medication patches, central lines, cab, or other surgical scars. Be sure to carefully inspect patients posterior with assistance in a way to prevent further injury and document the method used. Inspect for any crepitus, bleeding, step-offs, or deformities of the spine, tenderness, contusions, punctures, retractions, or any other obvious injuries. Individually inspect the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx and consider application of a long spine board for full spinal motion restriction. See spine immobilization, per your local protocols and medical direction. Assess the abdomen inspecting and palpating all four quadrants individually, looking for any pain, distension, tenderness, guarding rebound tenderness, pulsating masses, contusions around the umbilicus or flank, bleeding, evisceration, lacerations, punctures, or any other obvious deformities or injury. Also assess for any PEG tubes, colostomy, or suprapubic catheters. Assess the pelvis for any crepitus, any bleeding or other discharge or incontinence, intact genitalia and peritoneum as indicated, any adult brief slash diapers and Foley catheters, as well as amount of urine in bag and any discoloration. Assess both arms and legs bilaterally, inspecting symmetry, lengthening or shortening, inward or outward rotation, supination or pronation.
While this presentation is by no means exhaustive, by using some of these tips and tricks, you can become a better EMS provider. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this lecture.